If I haven't met you before, my name is Jeff Potts. I'm one of the pastors here at Canyon Hills, and it's just an honor and a joy to be here with you this morning. And uh, hey, Rob, how's it going? Good to see you. This is a friend from my life group. Don't, don't mind me as we have a conversation in front of all of you. Um, uh, I was talking to uh, Dale Murphy, the, the elder that came up and shared the devotion for um, communion this morning, and I said, hey, can I just get your notes, and we'll just preach through those again, and then we'll, uh, we'll go home and be fed, and that'll be really good. Um, but I don't get to do this very often, and so I'm going to go with my notes, if you don't mind, and, uh, and we'll do that together. Why don't you open in your Bibles with me to Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, we have been going through uh, this book for a number of weeks now. Pastor Steve has been preaching through it. He has uh, gone 13 consecutive sermons, and so he said, hey, that sabbatical felt pretty good in the summer. I think I'm going to take another break. And, uh, and so he asked me to fill in this morning, and I said, yeah, you bet. I love getting to do this. And as a quick recap for you, if it's your first time or first time in a long time, we have been, again, just walking through Nehemiah. Um, kind of a, in a cursory overview, and, uh, and a few weeks back, we looked at Nehemiah 8, uh, which Steve called Bring the Book, and that was where Israel reestablished God's word as their authority, and they noticed and saw and recognized their sin, and then they asked for forgiveness, and the thing that that applies with us today is that we can always look at God's word and that God's word is totally sufficient, totally relevant, and totally applicable to our lives, uh, Old and New Testament. And then in Nehemiah 9, there were two sermons uh, that Steve gave on repentance and how we go to the Lord and how we dwell on his character and how we then respond and ask for forgiveness in the things where we're not living according to his standards. And in the midst of chapter 9, they celebrated God's inexhaustible grace. And we, we worshiped in that last Sunday. And then in Nehemiah 10, the nation of Israel responds by committing together to be faithful and to be faithful to their, gen to their gracious and generous Savior. And so our title for today is Be Faithful, Responding to Inexhaustible Grace. H have you ever had a moment where you needed some grace? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> where you were completely at fault, no doubt about it, and you might have even been punished to some extent but not even a fraction of what you deserve. That's grace. And we come here to celebrate God's grace every Sunday morning. And we come to know it more and more. And a realization of God's grace completely changes your life. It changes your thoughts, your motivations, and your actions. And, and we come here to worship God because he has a never-stopping, always active, constant grace. And that grace secures us in his son, in the work of Christ, for the purpose of worshiping God and giving glory to him. So like the chorus we just sang, there's another chorus that adds on to it. It says, oh come, let us adore him. And then it says, we'll give you all the glory and we'll praise your name forever. And because of God's grace, we now get to live with purpose and meaning because we live now, with and for God, and because of God's grace, we no longer have to work to try and earn his favor, but we can live in response to the love that he's shown us. And God calls us this morning, just like he's calling his people in Nehemiah, to a growing affection and increased faithfulness in our relationship with him. And so we respond to God's inexhaustible grace by living faithful. This hits every aspect of our lives, our closest relationships, our work, our time, and even our wallets. And God's grace changes every part of our lives and our call is to be faithful to him in response. What does it look like to be faithful? To be faithful is to be consistent. It's to be someone that you can count on. To be faithful also means to look like and be like the original. And as we increase in our faithfulness, we look more and more like Christ to the world, shining a bright light of hope into a world that needs it. But what does it look like to make a commitment to faithfulness? And we have an example of that from God's word. So if you are at Nehemiah 10, why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word and let's look at it together. I am not trying to butcher 
a bunch of names in verses 1 through 27, so we'll start in verse 28. (laughs) And thank you for your grace to me in that. Verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burn offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God, according to our Father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as is written in the law. Verse 35. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord and also to bring to the house of our God to the priests who minister in the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle as is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God and to bring the Levites, the tithes from our ground for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Thank you. You guys can have a seat. Let's pray together. Father, we are here because of your grace. We are here responding to your grace in worship this morning and remembering all of the amazing things that you've done for us. And Lord, as we continue to worship you in the, in the looking at and the thinking critically on your word, uh, Father, I pray that your spirit would move in this place and that we, there would be hearts convicted and hearts changed. Lord, I know that there are people here who do not uh, have a great relationship with you. They know you in name but they don't love you and they don't follow your commands and they certainly don't know who you are in your word. God, I pray that they could hear that you are a faithful, loving, gracious God and that we can respond to you in holiness because of what you've already done for us. We ask these things in your name, amen. So this morning we are going to look at five commitments to faithfulness. This is what the nation of Israel committed to but it is also what we can apply to our lives this morning. So let's just jump right in. The first one is be faithful with biblical community. Be faithful with biblical community. God saves sinners into a community of believers. And so we respond to God's inexhaustible grace by investing in biblical community. Look at verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles. The, the beginning of the chapter that I conveniently did not read, uh, more for your benefit than mine, because I would have butchered all of those names. The beginning of the chapter points to Nehemiah and 83 other key leaders. These are the priests, the Levites, and and the chiefs, and they are all committing arm in arm to change. And and the reform starts with the leadership, but then very quickly involves everyone. And that's the same for us. Change is not simply a, a top decision that trickles down to other people. 
but change is a community project. We need each other to grow into the image of Christ. It takes every single one of us. Do, do you remember what Steve said last week? If you were here and you got to hear the message, he said at the end, he said that God's purpose is to see us conformed into the image of Christ. And really, he just pulled right from Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also pre predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So God's purpose, God's plan in our life is not only to save us, but then to comprehensively and patiently change us to make us look less like we used to and to make us look more like Christ. And so he shapes us and molds us and, and puts things in our life that, that draw us closer to him. And he does that, and that's his plan, but he does that in order that Jesus might be the first of many brothers. Many brothers. God saves us into a family. In, in Ephesians 2, Paul writes about how the Christian is saved and brought near by the blood of Christ and then is simultaneously folded into a membership of other believers. Milton Vincent wrote a book called The Gospel Primer. It's a, it's a great um, read. I would encourage you to read it. It's nice and short too. But he says, The gospel is not just a message of reconciliation with God, but it also heralds the reconciliation of all believers to one another in Christ. Through the death of Christ, God has brought peace where there once was hostility, and he has broken down the racial, economic, and social barriers that once divided us outside of Christ. That makes me think of the life group that Ashley and I, my wife and I have um, on Thursday nights. We lead a, a link group, college and young adults, and every Thursday night, we have this group that comes together, and we have amazing diversity within our group. We have different levels of education, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different skin colors, different languages, different voting preferences, different hobbies, and it's great. It's like the only thing that we have in common with each other is Jesus. And we are just a, we're a motley group committing to knowing God more and growing in our love and affection of him. And, and, and we were praying this last Thursday and I was praying with a group of the guys and we were, there we are praying hand in hand and just praying for each other and praying that God would, would help us to grow in our love and affection for him and that we would know him more and that we would sin less and that we would and that we'd be able to have wisdom in, in the midst of life circumstances and we're praying for the person next to us and, and all of this stuff and, and I'm and I'm drawn to tears because all I can think of while I'm holding my friend's hand on my left and my friend's hand on my right is how much I need this. Like I need this so much. I need other people in my life who are praying for me, who are encouraging me, who are, who are, who are interceding for me so that I can be faithful to God. How about you? Are, are you joining with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you faithfully invested in a biblical community? Are you in a life group? And if you are in that life group, how, how are you praying for the people in your group? How are, how are you invested? How are you contributing to your group? How are you serving your group? The call that we have here in the text and the call that we have today is be faithful to God with others. The second thing I see is be faithful to know and obey God's word. Be faithful to know and obey God's word. God saves sinners and continues to pursue a deeper relationship with them. And so we respond to God's inexhaustible grace by faithfully seeking God in his word and then applying it to our lives. And a commitment to faithfulness is going to find its foundation in God's word. Let's look at verse 29 together. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. There was an understanding that their commitment was, was serious. It meant a lot. 
If they disobeyed the law, they said as much, we understand that we are entering into a curse, that you will punish us for not doing what we're committing to do. But if we obey the law, we are entering an agreement with God where he will bless us and he will protect us and he will be with us. And this is really the main thrust of their commitment together as a nation. We will observe God's word and then we will actively obey it. So we're gonna hear God in his word, we're going to obey God from his word, and then we're just gonna repeat that cycle over and over and over again. And that applies for us this morning because faithful Christians are committed to know God's word. We, we are committed to know God's word. And, and this requires time, thinking, consideration, but we consider the law of God so that we can understand it. And, and there is just incredible joy in every depth of relationship that we have with God because the deeper we go, the more satisfied we are in him because God's word reveals his holiness and love for us as sinners all at the same time. It points out your sin while showing his patience. It gives you overwhelming hope, not in your goodness, but in his faithfulness. And so the more we understand God, the more we understand love and grace and peace and joy and rest. And the more we obey him, the more we see his glory and power and kindness spread to others. And so there is incredible fulfillment that comes with our growth in Christ, and that comes from reading the text that he's given us. Bring us the book. Bring us the book indeed. Faithful Christians know God's word, but faithful Christians are also committed to obey what God's word says. The nation of Israel committed to observe the law, but they also committed to, to do the law. And earlier in the passage, they, they promised to walk in God's law. And that just reminded me of Paul speaking to the Colossian church. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. God is looking for faithful people who will not only understand scripture, but consistently obey his word. Before I was working here, I worked for my dad. He owns a painting company. And, uh, and so what did I do? I painted, of course. And, uh, and while I was his grunt for many, many, many years, he would tell me to do certain things. And, his, and, and what he would tell me to do was pretty simple, but there were implications that, that went with it. So he would say, Jeff, um, go and paint the wall white. Pr pretty simple, right? And yet there's things that I have to know and understand to be able to obey that correctly. First, I, I have to paint. I can't just take a bucket of, of white paint and throw it onto the wall. I need to use the proper equipment. I need to do it correctly. I'm supposed to paint the wall. As I learned over the years, painting the wall does not mean painting the ceiling or painting the other walls or painting the lamp or painting the artwork or the light fixtures or painting the carpet. Um, so you have to paint the wall. And then the last thing is you have to paint the wall white. Don't paint it red or yellow or blue or green or pink or whatever you think would work better. Paint the wall the way that I've asked you to do it and be faithful in that. It's simple, but there's criteria that we have to understand to be able to follow through. And Jesus said, as much. Jesus is interested in our obedience. He says, my family, my mother, and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. God is interested in obedience because that's the proof that we understand what he's telling us. And we are called to be consistently hearing and obeying God's word. And so for you this morning, are you seeking God in scripture? Is Bible reading a consistent practice in your life? And take it a step further, are you applying scripture to your life? D does your daily Bible reading affect your daily habits? Who's in your life group that holds you accountable for your reading and for obeying God's word? Well, if I could set out a challenge for you in 2017, it would be read every single word of the Bible, the whole thing. 
and do it with someone else. Be faithful to know and obey God's word and, and do it with other people. The Israelites joined together to commit to God's word and, and they were committing to the totality of the law and saying, hey, we're gonna follow every bit of it, everything, that's the big picture. And then now here are some issues that we specifically need to address and specifically need to commit to. And so the first two points were kind of large and then these next few points are a little more specific, but again, they still apply to us today. Third one, be faithful to put God first in marriage. Be faithful to put God first in marriage. Verse 30, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. God saves sinners and gives marriage as a picture of his love for us. And so we respond to God's inexhaustible grace by committing to God's standards in marriage and in our pursuit of marriage. The Bible defines marriage in Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5 as one man and one woman being faithfully bound together as an image of God's intimacy with us. It is pure, it is beautiful, it is good. God loves marriage. He established it as the first explanation of human interaction. He gives us within it the ability to have amazing intimacy socially, emotionally, physically, and even spiritually. And God values marriage above every other relationship because it is a picture of how much he loves us. And God calls us to honor him with our marriages, and that is a high calling. And Israel realized this from, from reading scripture. And they realized that they were falling short because they were giving their sons and daughters away to other nations that didn't worship God. And so they said, we will stop doing that. Now, now, this is not a verse about interracial marriage. This is not a verse about some kind of caste system or social order. This is a verse about Christians marrying or even pursuing to marry someone who is not a Christian. I, I just got back from Peru uh, about a month ago, and, and I went with... Ashley, my wife, and a team from Link, our college and young adults ministry, and uh, it was 13 of us total. We just had a great time serving and, and honoring the Lord, but I had a particular conversation with a, with a student who, who was living over in Peru. He's from there, and he was pursuing and kind of spending significant time with a, with a young woman, uh, someone that was in his, her, his college, and he liked her a lot, and uh, it was very obvious when he talked about her. Um, how much he liked her. And she was interested in Jesus, but there wasn't a lot kind of showing up in her life, and he was um, very committed to the Lord, at least what he was saying. And so eventually, after listening and listening and listening, the guy was totally Twitter-pated with this chick, and um, <laughs> and so eventually I just said, hey, hey man, um, if is God first in your life? And he said, well, yeah, of course. And I said, okay, is God first in her life? And he goes, probably not. I said, okay, well, if Jesus is Lord and Savior in, life, in your life and you are pursuing someone who doesn't love Jesus with all their heart, uh, eventually you're going to come at an impasse. And, and the question is, are you willing to compromise your relationship with Jesus to have a relationship with someone else. And, and I think that the question fits this morning. So to my single friends, how, how are you pursuing marriage? How are you honoring the Lord in that? What is your filtering system for a potential spouse? As Christians, our number one criteria for a spouse is not a physical attribute or a bank account balance, but a genuine and dynamic relationship with God. And are you staying true to godly convictions with your dating habits and even with your purity? To my married friends, how, how does your marriage reflect 
your relationship with God? Are you living by God's standards within the confines of your marriage? Are, are you protecting the purity of your marriage and of your spouse? Because we are called to purity even after the wedding vows. And God calls us to purity, and biblical marriage protects that purity through God-glorifying intimacy and love and vulnerability. We are committed as a church to celebrate and invest in, in biblical marriage. It's a big reason why we started a young marriage ministry last year and we just wanted to celebrate and promote marriage the way that God intended and to really try to foster good relationships as people are creating a foundation for the rest of their life. But really our desire church-wide is that this would be a place where biblical marriage can grow and be celebrated and where it can thrive. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about this next year is um, we're, we are having a big marriage conference by a guy named, the, by a, my goodness, say it, Jeff, with a guy named Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp is a, is a uh, big-time Christian author, and he writes on marriage and on the heart and on biblical counseling. He's just a, we're huge fans of him. And he's come in June 16th and 17th to come and talk with us about, uh, about marriage, and this isn't just something that we're going to do for the young marrieds here in the church. This is something for every married couple in the church. And even over and above that, this is not just for the people that are married. This is for the people that are currently single, that are hoping to be married someday, that are on the path to marriage, that maybe even haven't considered marriage to this point. Uh, we want you to know what God has to say about this subject. And we are excited about it. We're committed to it. And, and I hope that you guys will kind of earmark that in your schedules. God has called us to put him first in our marriages and in our pursuit of marriages. And let's be faithful in doing that. Fourth point this morning, be faithful to worship God with your time. Be faithful to worship God with your time. God saves us to worship him, to give him all the glory. And we respond to God's inexhaustible grace by faithfully setting aside time to give him that glory. Verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. When they looked at God's word, they realized that they were compromising their Sabbath. That they were changing their worship habits around to be able to play to the public marketplace just to put it simply, the Sabbath was not a very special day for them. And I was reading this and I was reminded of what Pastor Kobe taught about in the summer when we did our Ten Commandments series. And he taught on the Fourth Commandment in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The Jewish people were looking at God's word and they saw that they weren't honoring God with the day that God gave them to rest and enjoy his presence. They were just doing business as usual, as if it was any other day. I mean, I, I looked at this passage, and, and, and I just had to ask the question, Jeff, how about you? Look in the mirror. Does God get your best time? Jeff, is there, is there something that gets in the way of you being able to worship God? Jeff, does your schedule reflect having God first in your life? Is worshiping God just an optional thing on Sunday? Is worshiping God just another thing on Sunday? Jeff, are, are, are you just attending church on Sunday morning for all three services because you're getting paid to do it? Or because you love Jesus with all your heart and you genuinely want to grow in your faith in Him and you want to celebrate with other people that want to do the same? How about you? Does God get your best time? Is Sunday worship your priority? I mean, this is a weekly opportunity to join with brothers and sisters, with family in Christ, and to worship passionately, and to sing loud, and to learn more about God's character and our identity in Him, and it charges us up and, and it sends us out to go and extend hope to a world that really needs Jesus. 
And then, do you worship God with your time? Is it the best thing? Is it the priority thing? Or is it another thing? Be faithful to put God first with your time and your worship. The last thing, um, which much of the chapter is committed to, um, has to do with our budgets. The last one is be faithful to biblical giving. Be faithful to biblical giving. God saved sinners at a great cost by giving up his very best for us. And so we respond to God's inexhaustible grace with the way that we give. If we have a a heart that desires to worship God, then our budgets will be a direct reflection of honoring God and worshiping him above ourselves and above other people. I'm reading this book by Randy Alcorn. It's called Money, Possessions, and Eternity. And he says this. He says, our handling of money is a litmus test of our true character. It's an index of our spiritual life. Our stewardship of our money and possessions becomes the story of our lives. God is pursuing our heart, and our heart is often revealed by how we give. Let's just look back at the text, because most of the commitments given by the Jewish people in this chapter were directly related to their giving. And the first thing that the whole community commits to was to give to the work of the ministry. Verse 32 We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burn offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. And this is something that, again, started with leadership, but then very quickly involved everyone. They committed to give to the work of the ministry. And, and you, you heard the obligations that, that we are um, committing to give to, and it started sounding like this. We commit to giving so that the electric bill works, so that we can pay the electric bill, so that we can read our Bibles together on Sunday morning. We commit to giving uh, for different supplies necessary for all the youth programs running during the week, serving hundreds of students every month from elementary to college age. We will commit to give so that there's money for pamphlets in the counseling office so that we can have biblical resources for people who need to remember God's word in the midst of their situation. We commit to give so that there is shopping money to get fresh produce and meat um, for the 75 to 80 households that come to our food bank on Tuesday night. We will commit to give so that there are vests for the parking lot guys so they don't get run over in between services on Sunday mornings. They committed to give to the work of the ministry. Then they committed to give their first and their best. Verse 35. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits. And then they go on and say the first fruits of every tree, the first fruits of our herds and flocks, the firstborn of everything. The, the, these are not the leftovers. This is not like, Lord, whatever we have left, we'll just kind of give that to you and hope that that's good. No, we're going to give you the first thing. We're going to give you the best thing, the most valuable thing. What we value most, we're going to give to you. And then lastly, they also committed to manage the contributions well. Uh, We are going to give it to the proper people who will then oversee, put it in the proper place, and we're going to keep track of every little bit of it. Uh, So this is a call for the pastors and the elders of the church to manage the budget in a God-honoring way. There's just a ton here in in this little section Everyone commits to giving their first and best to the Lord for the work of the ministry, and then everyone commits to being accountable to collect and manage the money well. And so for us, next week, Randy Long, our our, our vice chairman of the elders, is going to come up and present our church budget. And so he is going to uh, give a report for 2016, our plan for 2017, and it's actually like a really exciting five minutes within the service because we get to talk about, hopefully, how we are carefully and diligently honoring God with every penny that he's blessed us with. The takeaway for us this morning is, as, as we have a, as a church, look at the text and say, man, we, we really need to make sure that we are taking care of the money that God's entrusted us with. Are you taking care of the money that God has entrusted to you? Do you financially give regularly, cheerfully, and sacrificially to the work of God? 
Every dollar that you touch is an opportunity to honor the Lord and, and he calls us to manage his money well and steward it for his purposes. And that begins with tithing, faithful tithing. Just as a, a quick review, to tithe is to give 10% of your income to the Lord. So if you make $10, you give $1. And it's our first and it's our best. So before taxes or before our retirement investments or before our mortgages or rent or before the kids' toys or before we go purchase the newest iPhone, um, we give to the Lord. Are you tithing? Are you giving? And, and if you're not, what's stopping you? What stops you from giving obediently and faithfully to God? Is it a lack of trust? Maybe you don't think that God is really gonna take care of you. Is it a lack of love? Maybe you don't give because you don't love God and you will save up and plan for things that you really love, like a vacation or a concert or a certain kind of clothing but there just doesn't seem to be money in the budget for the Lord. Do you not give because of a lack of discipline? Maybe you want to give. You see all the verses that talk about giving to the Lord, and yes, I want to give my first, and I want to give my best, and Saturday night comes along, and you check your balance, and you've got a zero. And you don't know where the paycheck went. Israel looked at God's word and, and they saw that they weren't obeying God in this area and so they committed to change. And we're called to do the same thing. Let's commit to be faithful in our giving. Now I have presented to you a, a list of things to do, five things to be faithful in. And let, let's just get back to the main thing. We are responding to the grace of God. If you are, if you are looking at this as a, as a list of things to do to be, um, to be good enough for the Lord, we're missing the point. We, we do this because of what God has done for us already. I, I love the verse that it showed from 1 Peter. It says that God, that Jesus himself bore our sins so that we could be dead to sin and live for him. And these are just simply ways that we now live for him with our relationships, with our time, with our budget, with our marriages. And we just commit and say, because of what you've done for us, Lord, we will now live by putting you first in all of those areas. And when we are growing in our faithfulness, in our consistency, we start looking more like the original we start looking more like Christ. And that is exactly what God has saved us for. Just be faithful. Be faithful. There's no greater calling for the Christian than to just simply follow through with what God tells you to do. He doesn't call us to be extravagant. He doesn't call us to be over the top or... or um, anything other than just consistently obedient. And over time, God is faithful to just use that to change us and mold us into the image of his son to be a great light for the gospel. And the more we do it, the more hope we have in him because we realize that it's all because of him that we can do anything. And we wanna do more for him. Let's pray. Before we, before we pray, we got our... Eyes closed, heads bowed down. And was there something that you heard this morning that you, that you heard that you're like, man, I need to change that? Was there something that you saw on the points or on the screen that you were like, man, that was a hard one to look at? I need to make a change. Do you need to commit to community? Do you need to find your Bible and start reading your Bible? Do you need to evaluate your schedule or your budget? Do, do you need to trust God with your marriage and start honoring him with your marriage? With this many people here in the worshiping this morning, I, I know that there are people here that don't know Jesus and don't love Jesus. And so forget everything else that I've said and just hear this. Just commit to knowing and loving God with all your heart. 
Just, just commit to that and say, God, for everything that you've done, for everything that you promised to do, God, I wanna follow you with my life. Well, we can talk about the details later, but first things first, God, I wanna follow you with my heart. And if you're here, I just beg you, just do that today. Because God has a grace that is, that is overwhelming and inexhaustible and always sufficient for you. And he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Put your faith in him today. For the rest of us, let's just pray to commit ourselves to the Lord and to obey him more and to, and to respond to what he's done for us. Father, we just come before you just so grateful because we just consider your faithfulness and how you did it perfectly with your son. God, and every bit of hope that we have is because of you. And so because of that, we wanna respond and we wanna live the way that you call us to live. Lord, for my, for my friends that are here, God, I pray that we would be faithful to you and to you alone, that we would put you first and that you would get the glory for that. God, we give you all the glory We give you all the glory because of the work of your son. We love you, God, in your name, amen. If you are here and you need prayer for something, we've got a small army of people that would love to pray with you and for you and, and just hear what's going on in life and try to encourage you. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, uh, the most important thing for you, if you wanna know more about that, is come down here, get some more information. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to encourage you, give you something that you can, that you can read and consider. Um, and I pray that you do that today. Uh, God bless. Have a great day. We'll see you guys next week.